everybody. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. Tonight's broadcast is about family conflict. And this topic was suggested to me by one of our staff. And at first I thought it's, it's, it's way too generic to, to talk about com family conflict. And what could I say about it except for that it's unpleasant, it's ubiquitous, and uh, you, know, you know we're all challenged by it. But, but I took on the challenge and thought I'm going to present it. And, and like always, I'm going to try to give you some unique aspects or, or look at it. I'm going to also draw upon other concepts that I've, I've spoken about on this broadcast because I think there's other things that relate to that. So that's my preamble for tonight. To begin, conflict may not be a simple measure of how your child is doing. It can signal a need for the family to change or for parental adjustment. Conflict is a signal. Interpreting the signal correctly is a key. And, and I think I'll start off with the idea that a lot of parents talk about family conflict as a simple measure, right? A, a direct sign that the child is struggling. And, and it might not be that. It might be something else. It's natural for conflict to increase when children enter adolescence, for example. It's natural, even healthy, for conflict to be conflict to be triggered or increased when a child turns two, right? There are developmental tasks in that. And then sometimes health can be measured in a parent or in a family by their ability to go through the various stages with some flexibility. In other words, uh, the response that you might have to somebody at age five and 10 and 15 and 20 aren't the same kinds of same quality of responses. And so sometimes there, there can be an adjustment there. I remember in graduate school hearing about the research also about children that were in daycare. And, and one of the difficulties with children in daycare is that oftentimes, and in, you know, I, I imagine almost all cases, parents were working, exhausted when they came home. So there wasn't time for what they called healthy conflict, right? Because if a parent's working all day and then comes home at the end of the day, they're going to overvalue cooperation. And the child is not going to have practice at working through and struggling with difficulty and con conflict. And the child themselves have been in a day daycare situation where likely there's been higher than at home a, a child to adult ratio. And so that environment overvalues cooperation. So conflict is more complex than just something to be avoided, something that's, that's, that's negative and something that is showing us a sign that something is wrong with the child. As I thought about it and thinking about it in a different way than, than just what you might think about it uh, like on the surface, I thought about these, these kinds of dichotomies. I'm going to start off with the idea of tools versus insight. And, and maybe insight even isn't the right word. Maybe it's more about uh, a, a character logical change, right? The, a change in, in how you are and sensibility, a, a, a kind of a growth. But a lot of times people want tools, oftentimes communication tools. It's probably one of the most commonly asked questions that I get from, from families that are in conflict is, we need better commu communication tools. And while tools can help, tools can, tools can augment the change that goes on in the system or the individuals, tools aren't always the thing. They don't do it for you. Tools can also be weaponized. And if it were just about tools, somebody like me who studies tools all the time, well, then I'd be pretty near perfect as a parent. And of course, I'm nowhere near that, that end of the continuum in my parenting progress, parenting enlightenment. So, so for me, it's, it's the, the depth that makes the change. And then the tools on top of that, that change and that depth can make a difference. I'll talk tonight about the eight tools also and how those can, if we allow them to, they can create change in us. So we can, we can change from the outside in if we allow ourselves to practice that discipline. Behavior versus healing. When we reduce children to a behavior, right, when they become merely a symptom, and we don't look at the symptom as a sign of something we need to pay attention to, to follow back home to, to the wound, the scar, the, the hurt, the pain. We miss the opportunity to, to hear and get the lesson that the behavior is telling us, that the behavior is trying to tell the child. And, and so as we start to talk about 
this broadcast and, and what we're thinking about, I'm really talking about principles of transformation and enlargement. I know some of you have been at this some time. I recognize some of the names here on the list. And because I know you, I know that your capacity is larger than it was years ago when you started this journey. I know that's true. I, I can say the, the same for myself. So if my capacity enlarges, if I transform in such a way to hear things differently, to see things differently, then that's going to create less conflict in the family, right? When a child shows up struggling, I'm going to have less of a need for them to conform, and I'm going to be able to, be able to provide a psychological and, and behavioral container with less conflict. So learning to contain, learning to see them, learning to hear. And I, I want to be very, very clear. If it hurts you, right, you can take care of yourself. So I'm not talking about tolerate something, tolerating something that's against your values, that hurts you, that threatens you, that makes you feel uncomfortable in a profound way. What I'm talking about is that as you change, it hurts you less. As you change, it scares you less. As you change, it disappoints you less, it frustrates you less, it angers you, you less. Right? You, you have a different perspective. You're seeing through different eyes. The idea that we have in families about being right versus being a self. Most families that haven't been through this process, most of the families that we grew up in, the thing was about being right. right? Who's right, who's wrong? Versus saying, this is the way to, that I feel. This is my boundary. You know, being right gets in the way of being a self. You know, we recruit experts. We recruit wise people that have left great quotes, right? We recruit researchers, sociologists, child psychologists. We recruit, all, we recruit religious people. We recruit them to say, see these people, right? The proverbial they said it. Because we don't have an experience that it's okay just to say, I don't like it. I hear people say, women are like this or men like this in defense of something that's theirs. While that generalization may be true, women tend to be like that or men tend to be like that or, or, or pick your category. It's just okay also if you're the only one that thinks and feels that way. You don't have to be right. So being right is something, I, I, I say this all the time, if you're going to do this work in this way, you don't get to be right anymore. And as a matter of fact, it's absolutely liberating. Control versus influence. There's a chapter, chapter on this in my book. I have a broadcast about control versus influence. And control is about outcomes. Control is about, uh, the way I talk about it, it's about emotional coercion. Intimidation, fear, shame, threats. Influence is about healthy boundaries. I've said this before, children, people can thrive in, in all kinds of, of levels of structure. What they don't thrive in or what they really struggle to thrive in is an emotionally coercive environment, an environment where there's shame and, and there's fear, hostility, anger, intimidation. That's hard. It's hard to be in a relationship where somebody is trying to control you, but it's not, it's not effortless, but it's a lot easier to be in a relationship where somebody shows up with boundaries, not being right, letting go of the outcome, and follows through with their boundaries. And again, I, I'm not saying, this is very important, that every child, every person will do everything we want then. Absolutely not. But it's a different soup to grow up in. Objectification versus understanding. Objectification is the idea of turning a child into an extension of us, a reflection of us. You know, thinking about it in terms of how can I manipulate this person versus understand this person. I've told the story about a young man in our program who came to us with a very severe trauma background. And his diagnosis was, was attachment disorder. And in supervision, talking to the staff and the therapist about the idea 
that stop trying to fix him. That, that's a very deep wound. It's going to take a, a great deal of time to, 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 to heal. And the energy you put into trying to fix him, he's going to make it fail because he, he wants you to know. He wants you to feel how he feels, first of all, to some extent. But he wants to say in his resistance, this is wound is real. Stop telling me to get rid of the armor that I, that I built to protect me from, from it and from future wounds like it. So you shift to a model of understanding. And, and I loved being in the field this summer because I've, I've talked about this. This model works out there, right? I, I saw the more I leaned into this, and I, I, I've developed this more and more since the last time I was in the field, being a field therapist, the more I leaned into this idea that it's about understanding versus behavioral change, understanding versus fixing. I saw more rapid and deeper growth. So it's pragmatically speaking more effective to get the outcome that we want. It's not perfect. The minute you, you, you let your mind go to that place, that simple cause and effect, effect place, you, you've undermined the, the very concept you're trying to live by. Boundaries versus conflict. Boundaries don't necessarily inherently have conflict in them. If we define conflict as two people, right? You can have boundaries and not participate in the battle, the power struggle. And that's what so many of you, I, I know you, I've sat in groups with you in Los Angeles and, and New York and other places in San Francisco. Um, so many of you have realized that you can develop and work on boundaries, and it's not easy. You know, some of the books that just say have good boundaries, that's ridiculous. Yeah, I know have good boundaries. The question I always ask is, why are they hard for me? You know, where's the, where's the wound in my life that makes it difficult, at times seemingly impossible, to have a healthy boundary, to, to exercise a healthy boundary? In mental health, it is not a moral imperative that leads to change. A mental health lens changes the frame and the study of human behavior and offers a glimpse beneath the surface and our response while firm needn't be cruel or bereft of compassion. Right? I asked in supervision some years ago of my therapist, I, I asked when somebody quoted their rabbi or their priest, I can't remember the specific context that's happened more than once, dozens and dozens of times, that they were getting a, a different message from the pulpit than what I was giving them. And I looked for answers about how I respond to that. And my therapist gave me wonderful advice. She said, tell him you're not a religious leader. Tell him you're a therapist and that this is your lens. You don't have to do battle with that. That's not the way you look at the world. And again, it, it, it got me out. Right? The only way through that effectively was out. So when somebody says to me, this is my value, this is what my, my, my church leader, my, my, my rabbi is telling me, my response is, okay, I, I respect that. would never ask you to give that up. This is what I know about mental health. And again, it's not a moral imperative. It's not a should. It's not a be a good person. In a mental health perspective, you can't not be a good person. It's not about good and evil. It's about broken or hurt or wounded, struggling, defended. Yes, those things hurt other people, but that doesn't make you bad. It just makes you wounded and in need of support. I want to pull in the eight tools because while I, I say this is not a tool thing, I do believe that these tools, as, I, as I've worked with them over the years, over the last couple of decades and more, that these are the ones that I see that can if we follow them, if we make them our practice, can begin to have some impact on the way that we are in our relationships, the way that we are in the world. You can go to the broadcast on the eight tools for transforming relationships if you want to go in depth with them. The I statements, taking ownership, I feel, I think, I want, I believe, versus you statements or statement of fact, me telling you the way the world is. In my experience, this is what works for me. Reflect, reflective listening, there might be 
no more important skill than this, right? Learning how to listen. I, I love the story that, that I refer to often where a father in, in his first session said to me, I'm a good listener. I know that. I, I do this for a living. My son's making up excuses when he says, I don't listen. And three or four weeks later, after doing some of this work with that same father coming back and said, I'm a horrible listener, and so is everybody else I've noticed, as I've understand what it means to listen to somebody deeply. You know, not, not, I love this quote that I heard from somebody that said, what's the opposite of listening? Waiting is the opposite. In order, in terms of waiting to respond, waiting to rebut, being triggered, explaining things on and on and on. So listening without judgment, reflecting back to let the sender know that you've heard them, having them confirm that. Sometimes in life, many times in life, when we do it really well and really deep, that's enough. It doesn't feel like enough, but it's enough. Asking the other person in a conversation or relationship for what you need when you share. This is what I would like from you. Can you just listen? All right? Can you sit silently and hear my feelings? Especially if those feelings are, are, are triggers for that person. Especially if you've been triggered. Especially, especially if some of those feelings are about or related to that other person. Asking them to listen on the front end really sets you both up for success. Also, if you're the receiver, asking what they would like from you. It's amazing how often we don't do that, that, that if we did that, if we said to somebody when they were sharing something difficult and we were having a difficult reaction, if we could just say, what would you like? Do you want me to just listen? And by the way, the, the real trick is they're often going to say, no, I want to hear what you're thinking. But they don't want to hear what you're thinking. And you learn that very quickly because when you tell them what you're thinking in response to their share, you end up in an argument. And that's something I've had to learn over time. I've had to learn to resist the, the, the question that I get asked in my relationships. Well, what are you thinking? What, what's your thoughts about this? Going on, avoiding imperatives. Uh, nearly universal tool. You know, it's, it's rare that, that I have an inclination to use the words should, ought to, good, bad, right, wrong, have to, need to. You know, switch it to an I statement. Instead of saying you need to stay in school or it's good to stay in school or you should stay in school, you said, you say in my experience, it opens up doors. It immediately changes the power struggle. It immediately lowers the chance of receiving a defensive, reactive response. And the other person's and the child's need for autonomy, for, for separation, for differentiation. You're making the best contribution you can when you take away those words. Avoiding, avoiding polarizing language. I, I don't think this one needs a long explanation because I think we all know this. You know, things like you always, you never, um, you do this all the time. Uh, catastrophizing, generalizing, globalizing. You're this way in all of your relationships, right? This is the worst thing ever. It's, it's really, really difficult to respond to that when you're on the other side of that conversation, when somebody uses polarizing language. I think that's pretty simple and straightforward. But, but again, going, going back to this one and the rest of them, why do we use this kind of language? And the reason is, this is why the tool is not everything. The reason is because we lack a sense of self. Right? We, we want to be right. We want to, we want to, our feelings need to be justified by how absolutely universally, consistently horrible you are. Because it's not enough to say, yesterday I felt hurt by you. All right? We should get over it. But, if we say you're horrible all the time and you never listen to me and you never care, well, that's something that anybody would be justified in feeling hurt or upset, right? Avoiding advice. Again, as I grow in this process, 
my um, lack of advice giving gets younger and younger and younger, meaning that that it's not just with peers or spouse or clients, but it's with children. There's other ways to talk about this without giving advice. You know, I have my children now. My youngest is 11. My oldest is 25. I don't give my 11-year-old advice. Not intentionally. Right? Not, not if I'm aware. Not if I'm conscious of what I'm saying. I have boundaries. I, I tell her what works for me. I tell her how I feel. There are limits and consequences and so forth. But it's not advice. It's just like if you want to do this, I think this works this way. This is what works for me. This is what I found. You know, my, my 11-year-old daughter just said the other day, I asked her this morning actually, what she wanted to, if she had an idea about what she might want to be when she grew up. And it's just changed. We were just on the way to school. And she said, I want to be a director or a therapist, which, she, which is a new thing that she's been saying. And she told me that the reason that she's thinking about being a therapist right now, which of course could change, of course, over the next 15 years, is that she's starting to realize that she knows things because it's in the air. She knows when she's being shamed by a teacher. She knows when somebody's trying to talk her out of her feelings. And she says it. She's, I've had teachers tell me that she said, stop shaming me. And I've said, did you? Were you? And they're surprised by my, my response. And I've heard her talk to her friends. And so this is 11 years old. And, and, and so it started for me, you know, and I've grown since I had my first child, of being this way more and more and more and still have a ways to go. It, it, it still gets in there. You don't know other people's truth. And what that means is some of the most important lessons I've learned in my life are from the detours, from the mistakes. They're hard to learn another way for, for a lot of us. And so I look back on, on decisions and, and parts of my journey that, I, that I've since abandoned or since removed myself from that situation, context, relationship, whatever it is. And it's been a really good decision for me, but I don't necessarily regret the mistakes and the detours and the things that at one point seemed like they made, made sense. That's what I mean by you don't know somebody else's truth. What I try to do, and I, I do it sometimes when I'm talking to somebody and I, and I have an, an impulse to give advice, I try to say, I have a thought, I have an idea. I don't need to be right, but what if? And part of that is a technique, but part of that is, again, a, a practice to remind me that I don't know. The, the great thing that I've learned about giving advice in that way by saying I have a thought or an idea that may fit or may not is that if somebody says to you, well, that's a stupid idea, you can easily retreat. You haven't painted yourself in a corner with them. Developing a compassion toward yourself and others. Practicing what the Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh calls a dear one attitude towards others and yourself. Not hating your symptoms, your, your depression, your anxiety, your addictive tendencies, your, your narcissistic tendencies, right? Your dependent characteristics. Not hating them, but understanding them. Treat them gently. Be around people that treat them gently. Be with a therapist or a support group that treats them gently. Listen to these broadcasts where I talk about them gently with respect. In you and in, in your children and others around you. But we've learned that the way that we're going to grow is to hate our sins, right? to hate our mistakes, to hate our, our fall, faults and our flaws our weaknesses. We think that that's the cure. And in the short term, those symptoms, those, those weaknesses, sometimes they, they dissipate temporarily. But they'll sprout up somewhere else in your garden. Right? You haven't really gone to the root. To, to go to the root, it's got to be with love and compassion. 
If your compassion does not include yourself, it's incomplete. And lastly, kind of the, the one that you go to when, when you can't do all these things. And when you're upregulated, anxious, angry, hurt, threatened, none of the other skills are going to matter. So retreat to your practice, whether it's meditation, walking, exercise, therapy, reading, breathing, whatever it is. Retreat to your practice. If your feelings escalate, you're unable to have a dear one attitude towards others. Take a time out until you're able to respond. And when you get to an, an 8 or a 9 or a 10 on the, on the 1 to 10 anger scale, you don't want to take a time out. So you're going to have to take a time out before you're out of control. We used to create an anger scale where, where people would come up with a word, maybe from bothered or, or, or annoyed to, to rage, right? They would come up with one word for each number on the scale of 1 to 10. And I would explain to them, you get to an 8, you're not going to be able to take a time out. You're not going to be able to, you won't care about any I feel statement. 7, maybe. 6, you got a chance. 5, about 50-50. you got to learn about yourself enough that once you start going up that scale, you get to a 3, 4, 5, 6, somewhere in there, you're going to have to take some time so that you can treat the other person with compassion. Some of, of, of family conflict is the result of poor, fused boundaries, right? Instead of coming from a place of a control towards somebody else, I think about boundaries coming from a place of self-management, self-care. This is what I'm comfortable with. I'm not comfortable with you smoking and drinking. I'm not comfortable with this curfew. I'm not comfortable with this situation. And developing enough confidence, enough, enough groundedness, enough clarity to just stand on that ground and stop thinking about fixing them. Boundaries in this way of thinking aren't for changing other people. They're for self-care. And they do they do teach other people things. They're fantastic. A parent with, with healthier boundaries is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing for a child. And gives them a, a true north. Right? Requires them to develop with another. Helps them develop empathy. Helps them de develop delay of gratification. And again, going back to the compassion piece, our, our struggle with boundaries isn't our lack of knowledge of them although that can help a little bit. Our struggle with boundaries is, is our own childhood, right? Our own experience, our own attachment, our own history. Communication tools are not boundaries. Communication tools become really unimportant when we begin to talk about boundaries. And a lot of us use communication to try to get the other person to change, to give them a sense of, of the obligation they have to our feelings. That our feelings are their responsibility, the, the outcome, the fault of their behaviors. And if they have a loving bone in their body, they'll change so that we feel happier. Using fear, intimidation, shame, and threats to control behavior versus boundaries. I love this idea. I think about it often. You can't win, you can only choose how to lose. That's a, that's a nice mantra towards the principle of letting go of the outcome. Find your truth, find your center, find yourself, express it, assert it, and stop measuring the value of that process by the outcome, the reaction of the others. Otherwise, the, the, the children are training us. How we substitute just about everything else for boundaries in our lives. It's just such a common thing. I do it all the time, even as, as trained as I am. Conflict is not inherently per pervasive. Conflict is not inherently pervasive in the context of a child having mental health or addiction issues. But it's common. But it's not necessarily what it's all about. Developing compassion towards self and others, like I mentioned. Treating underlying shame, in my experience, is the key to the foundation to making communication tools work for you.
without that work, without doing battle with guilt and, and shame, in other words, healing our own childhood wounds, the, the tools become almost meaningless and it's sometimes even hurtful or, hurtful or distracting. Harmful or distracting. You know, it reminds me of why I don't use behavioral contracts. Don't encourage them. If a person asks me, I'll give them an outline for it, but I, I don't... I don't value them very much. And it's because, like I say, I've never seen a, a child violate a contract where when you point it out to them, they look at the contract and say, you know what, you're right. It says it right there. Oh, and look, here's the consequence associated with the behavior. That's totally fair. I accept that. And you know what, I should have known better because I signed this. It doesn't happen. Behavioral contracts don't do the work. What I say to parents is, if you want to make a behavioral contract, you can make one. You don't even need to show it to the child. You can if you want to, <clears throat> but it's not going to do the work for you when it comes up, when the conflict comes up. The behavioral contract is for you to erase your self-doubt, your second-guessing, perhaps to hold you accountable to you, to remind you, so that you, again, don't, don't get influenced, impacted by their reaction after the violation. I talked about this. I've shared this one other time before. This is something I came up with to think about this idea of the keys to enlightenment, what it means to be enlightened. Learn to be okay with being wrong and get really good at losing. And, and what I mean by that is it's okay if somebody says you're wrong about this or that. You just say, okay, but I'm me. I have people try to talk me out of my dislike for mushrooms, 150 times in my life, at least. More. That's, that's an understatement. But I still don't like them. And I'm not going to try them anymore. I think I'm um, 40 years old. That's the last time I was willing to reconsider my, my dislike of mushrooms when somebody tried to talk me into it or say you couldn't really taste them. Uh, in the spaghetti or, or, or on the pizza. Come to know your darkness and remain on speaking terms with your mental illness is number two. Just know your issues. It's the best way to, to, to come to know other people, especially those that struggle. But in my experience, to know everybody, I've been thinking the last couple of days, I almost use nothing that I learned in school anymore. Almost nothing. Everything I, I've, I use as a therapist these days, I would say about 40% of it is from the practice of therapy itself. The other 60% is from being a client in therapy. There's a few lingering principles that, that inform me that I refer back to, but it, it's not the stuff. Learn how to die again and again. Learn to let go. Learn to question old ideas. Take yourself out of old contexts, beliefs, relationships. Th those are what it means to be a, a self, an enlightened self, versus being good, which is the enemy. Being good, being a good father, being a good mother, being a good spouse is the enemy of growing. Because if I need to be good as a husband and father, that's a need of mine then everything that happens in our interactions is going to be in service of that need for my ego. If I accept that I'm a human, fallible person, right, an idiot, as I say, if I accept that, if when I'm called an idiot, I say to my children, to my friends, to my spouse, you have no idea of the depths of my idiocy. If I'm okay enough with myself to say that, in the moments that I am, I can't be pushed off my, my ground, my center. And I can just show up as me. And that's a powerful, powerful thing for both of us. So what are the take-homes? Separating your child's struggle from the conflict that you have. There are, those are two different things. They're related, but it's not everything. They're not synonymous. One is not a simple indicator of the other. 
your child is not your child not liking you or rebelling are not necessarily a measure of mental health their mental health you know i've had a lot of parents because we're, we're a program that serves teens and, and young adults they refer back to when the children were younger they listened to me more you know they 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 there was more affection, warmth. And also, you, you, your child not liking you, that's not an indicator of, of how well they're doing. We'll listen to it. We'll look there, but not necessarily. Work on yourself, your own differentiation. Right? That's, the, that's why we do this. That's, that's going to make the difference. That's why I talk about a lot of times at our, our Finding You Sometimes people want to come as a family, and that's fine. We do, we do family private intensives. I do them all the time. I did one last week. I did another one this week, and we're doing another one next week. We do them. And I will tell you, sometimes you can get a, as much out of an individual one in, a, in an ideal world where time and money were, were not uh, a limited resource. I would ask everybody to do both. Right? Do an individual one first and then do a family or, or a couple one afterwards. One creates a foundation for the other. If the family is very motivated, if they've had a great deal of therapy leading up to it, the family ones make, make a lot of sense as, as a starting point. Um, be patient with yourself. And... Um, it takes a long time. It's a lifetime's worth of work. Change from symptom reduction to learning about healthy attachment, resonance, listening, understanding, and healing. Communication skills are most helpful. I almost want to say only helpful, but I'll stick with most helpful when built on the foundation of a healthy self. Like I said, sometimes we learn from the outside in. Sometimes a practice or a discipline uh, of a way of communicating can lead to a difference in the way that we think and feel. It can have that impact. But, but the foundational stuff is the thing. And work on your shame in all of its forms. And while you, not be, you might not be one who identifies yourself as having a lot of shame, if you need to be right or good, that's shame, right? You just might be really high-functioning. And then avoiding power struggles, right? Power struggles, it takes two people to create, to participate in that. And, and conflict. If I walk out of this, this broadcast into my family room and, and start interacting with my children and they're not doing what I want them to do, I'm 50% responsible for the conflict in that situation. All right, I'm happy to take any live questions on topic. If there are no questions that are currently, I'm going to go to the upcoming slides and then take any questions that you might have. So, a 10, 6, 12 step support groups. We ask all current parents to attend six 12 step support groups. You can try a variation of any of them. Also, you can include in there refuge recovery meetings, uh, NAMI meetings and classes. Uh, all of these are, are free or, or nearly free, and not a lot in this work is free, and they can be a great, great source. And remember, Codependence Anonymous, Families Anonymous, um, they're not for people that are just in relationship to people that are addicted. They're just it, It's about how to be a human with other humans. I, I have been asked by the Evoke Family Foundation to, to announce that they have a crowd rise campaign, raising money for people who can't afford therapy. In 2018, they gave 73000 over $73,000 in grants and scholarships and helped 10 families, four of whom were active on, on January 1st of this year. Follow us on social media. All of these broadcasts can be found on your iPhone, iOS device, on the podcast app. Also, if you have an Android, they can be found on the SoundCloud app, download SoundCloud. Search Evoke Therapy Programs at either of those 
on either of those apps, or you can just go to a computer to evoke therapy. Excuse me, to soundcloud.com and search evoke therapy. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at evoke therapy. On Facebook, you can search and find us by searching evoke therapy programs. And you can also find the Evoke Family Foundation on Facebook by searching its name also. Our Evoke Therapy blog is a great resource of content. My book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, is available on Amazon, or, or you can get an audio version there. We want all current families, if you can, to go to a workshop. It's a two-day experiential with the staff, multifamily experience. It's wonderful. People rave about these. Um, if it, if it timing-wise works out well, you can combine that with a visit to visit your child in the field. Talk to your therapist about that. The next one is in Southern Utah, January 12th through 13th, and then the, in February, it'll be February 16th through 17th. Contact Colony at evoketherapy.com for more information. If you want to do a deep dive, in fact, the January 20th one is, is full with a waiting list. So the next one will be February 20th. If you want to do a deep dive into what I constantly talk about, finding you is the place to do it. Also, family or couples. Uh, we did a couple, we've done several couples ones, individual couples, meaning one, two people. Contact us uh, by emailing us at intensives at evoketherapy.com. I will be in New York City on January 14th, 7 to 9 p.m. The C City University of New York, just Kitty Corner on Fifth Avenue from the Empire State Building. If you want therapy light, family fun, sober fun, a kind of a, a therapy reboot, Pursuits is your program. Any adventure anywhere in the world, led by some of our wonderful staff. All right, any live questions? Question comes in. My child is coming to me with anger about her experiences in treatment. When asked what she wants from me, she wants me to help her expose her supposed abusers. I cannot help her for a number of reasons, including that I do not trust her version of events. Conversely, it triggers my feelings of guilt about some of the bad experience that I do know that she's been exposed to through her long history of treatment. I don't know how to be supportive, empathic without falling into what feels like a trap thought. Thoughts. Great question. It's a, it's, it's a more robust question than, than similar questions like it that I've been asked in the past. So what I say often is just say you're sorry. Maybe you were wrong. I don't know. I did the best I could, but it could have been wrong. And I am sorry. I'm sorry it hurt you. Try to say that, believe that, express it sincerely. Have no investment in her giving, getting over it. Now part number two, her asking you to expose her abusers. You're just allowed to say, I'm just not comfortable with that. She's going to ask you why. You're, that's going to be a trap. But you could just stick with the boundary. I'm not comfortable with that. I'll think about it, but not right now. You know, Besides the fact that you don't trust her version, you could say, for me, I just want to let go and move on. But you don't have to. You can stay with your anger. You can, you can work on it yourself, but I don't want to do that. So that's being wrong. That's willing, being willing to lose, but also maintaining a sense of self at the same time. That's the two principles in that response that... that Come to me when you ask that question. It's a really hard one, though. Really hard one. All right, folks, there are no further current questions. I'll be talking about risk-taking risk behavior. The, uh, in, in the teenage, adolescent brain, young adult brain, what that's all about. It looks like one question has come in that I'll, that I'll respond to or comment. Some, a parent shares, it's been my experience that family therapy heightens conflict since everyone is encouraged and vocal to, 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 to vocalize their feelings. Absolutely. That's another great point. Intimacy, I, I want to say this, not just family therapy. Intimacy requires a certain kind of tolerance for conflict. People think about inti intimacy like it's this warm, wonderful thing that everybody loves and feels happier about because everybody's closer and hugging. Intimacy meaning, means dealing with really uncomfortable feelings, saying really hard things, oftentimes in, in not, not the most graceful way, right? 
the path to int intimacy is tremendously painful. Tremendously difficult and uncomfortable. And oftentimes, if, you, if you're a good container for somebody and they share their truth with you, they're going to feel great and you're going to feel horrible. And you're going to be inclined to retreat, to pull away, right? And everybody's going to chalk it up to see what happens when I say how I feel. To get to a place of intimacy, you're going to have to walk through conflict, difficulty. I remember I had a, 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 an older gentleman say one time at a wedding to the couple, I heard him say, if you're not fighting, then one of you is an idiot. Kind of normalizing and even, even valuing the conflict and what can, what can offer. But it absolutely is unpleasant. And couple therapy and family therapy absolutely can raise conflict in the family. It's, it's necessary if we're going to get to a different place to kind of walk through that, but it can. So thank you for that comment. That's a great, great, great point. All right, folks, I'll talk to you this Thursday night, January 10th, 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.